the own, my own personal experiences are not particularly exciting or anything, but maybe they illustrate uh, a course of events that you might find interesting. You see, when I was in high school, taught in high school by Franciscans, later in university by Jesuits, I get the highest grades they ever had in religion. I used to write A plus 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 across the front of the page. Great praise, the teacher said, never had a student like this. These terrific grades in religion. But it, it occurred to me one day after two or three years of this, it, somehow it registered on my mind, the reason the grades are high is because I remember everything the man said. When it comes time for an exam, I can write down everything I heard him say and give it back. So I get a perfect mark. That doesn't mean it's true. That was my frustration. But I took it with my teacher saying, I can tell you all of this. I know the whole explanation. What is the proof? You see, we have to always decide when somebody's having a conversation with us, are they explaining it or are they proving it? People usually fool themselves. They explain it and they think they're proving it. If you ask somebody, how do you know Jesus died for your sins? What's the proof? He starts to tell you about, well, you see, God is holy, man's a sinner, Jesus has to die, and so on. That's not the proof. That's an explanation. That's how it's supposed to work. I know that. How do you know what happened, you see? It's the proof you want. In the Catholic Church, I couldn't find that, that proof, because they tend to look to authorities other than the Scripture, the Bible. Don't be confused. If there's one thing I wish I could hammer into everybody's head, it's this idea. Explanation is not the same as proof. I asked a man the last time I was in Australia. Same thing. I said, how do you, how do you know man has to have his sins redeemed? And he said, well, God is 100% holy. 100% holy. You are a sinner. God cannot deal with you directly because he is 100% holy. You are certain percentage sinner. It's an explanation. It's an explanation, but is it true? See, think about it. If I told you that in New York City is the holiest man that ever lived, I could talk about him for an hour maybe and I build up a great reputation. I say, he's the holiest human being that ever lived. Finally, maybe you'd say, well, I'm going to save my money. I want to go to New York City and meet him. I want to shake his hand. And I'll tell you, no, no, no. He won't even let you come in the same room with him. He's too holy. You can talk to his secretary, but he couldn't stand to look at you. He's too holy. Now what do you think of this man? Is he holy or is he crazy? See, an explanation is an explanation. It may or may not be true. It's proof of something else. What I wanted was proof. Did Jesus say so? I got into a discussion with a man who used to have a radio program on the Bible. And so I asked him if he could prove to me some of the things he believed. He said, I don't have a Bible. I said, I have one here. I put a Bible, which is called a red letter edition. They put all of the words of Jesus in red ink. And I'd ask him, do you believe such and such? And he'd say, certainly, here's the proof. And he'd open up the Bible and he'd read me something from the black ink. And I kept saying, no, show me in the red ink. Did Jesus say that thing? I said, I know Paul said it. I know this and that and the other thing. Did Jesus say that thing you tell me you believe? Well, he kept stroking my Bible like it was a pet cat. He was very fond of it. But I kept pushing that way and pushing. I kept saying, did Jesus say it? And suddenly he didn't like the Bible anymore and he threw it back in my face. He said, you know what your problem is? You won't believe it unless Jesus said it. Yes, that's my problem. It should be his problem. How does he dare to teach something if he can't sh and call himself a Christian if he can't show you that Jesus said this thing he's talking about? It should be easy to find if Jesus said some of the things people say he said. It should be easy to find. Do you know if you took all the words of Jesus reported in the Bible and eliminate the duplications because you have the same story basically told four times, if you eliminate the duplications, the total of all the words of Jesus do not even fill two columns of a newspaper. There's not very many words. So if he said these different things, you don't really have a lot of work to look down and find them. So as I say, among Protestant churches, I have been involved with the Church of England, the Presbyterians, Pentecostals, Baptists, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christadelphians, you name them. You probably can't name one I haven't heard of unless it's something local here. 
to be involved with them for nine years. I read their books and visited, took part in their meeting, used to teach some of their Bible classes. I kept coming back to this, what proof do you offer? What proof? So they bring out a handful of their favorite verses. John 3, 16, 8, 58, 10, 30, 14, and 9, 20, and 28, and so on. But for every one of those verses, there's another verse, which if you put it right beside that verse, you find out what they were trying to say won't work. Hebrews 11, 17, uh, Exodus chapter 3, uh, uh, John chapter 17, John chapter 5, and uh, Exodus chapter 6, to go in the order of the verses I named you there. You put those beside those verses, and the argument dissolves, among others. They don't prove the divinity of Jesus. Doesn't mean he's not divine. But these things don't do the job. That's the problem. I'm not saying he's not divine. I'm saying I still want to see the proof. Did he say so? Then the real test of sincerity was what disappointed me. You see, you can take one of these verses, somebody shows you um, John 14 and 9, for example. Jesus said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So I asked them, how is it he said in this other place to a group of people, you people have never seen the Father? Don't tell me in this place he means he's God, when in this place he told some people who were looking at him, you've never seen God. He must have meant something else. You tell somebody that and they'll say, okay, you have a point. What about this verse? And they go to another verse. It's fine. But next week, somebody will come to that same man and say, where's the proof that Jesus said he was God? He will read John 14 and 9, right back where he started from. A verse which a week ago he told me wasn't good enough. It'll be good enough for somebody else because he hopes he doesn't know the response I had. Beginning about 1969, the same story I seem to get when I go from church to church. I'd ask them, you know, if you took all the words of Jesus and you cut them out of the Bible with the scissors, and then I gave you some paste and told you, put them back together any way you like. Take all these words, put them back together, paste them together how you like. You still can't make him spell out the Trinity. He still doesn't say anything about it, no matter how you change these words. And so they'd tell me, it doesn't mean it isn't true. The Trinity is an evolved understanding. The church didn't understand this deep thought at first. The understanding evolved. Over the centuries it was discussed. People came to understand it and believe it. Fine. But if that's what you say, you shouldn't say, on the other hand, Jesus used to preach it. If you tell me people didn't figure it out for 200 years, don't tell me Jesus preached it. And so they would say, no, no, he preached it, but it's not in the Bible. He used to preach it to his disciples. He told them about it. Well, in the 18th chapter of John, Jesus says very clearly, I taught nothing in secret. He said, everything I had to say, I said in the marketplace. He didn't tell his disciples any secrets. More solutions are offered to me. People told me your problem is you're not spiritual enough. Believe, then it's easy. Believe. But you see, a person can't make themselves believe if they know better. What sometimes happens to human beings, they get a pain, so their head is hurting. They go to a doctor, they tell him, I've got this pain, it won't go away. The doctor makes some tests, a full examination, maybe some x-rays, and he finds there's nothing wrong. So he realizes the man's problem is mental. It's an imaginary pain. He doesn't tell the man that. He gives him a placebo. There are things that look like pills, but they're only milk sugar. Just sugar. He goes to his patient and he says, we've made some tests, this is the medicine you need. Take these pills and in one day your pain should stop. It almost always does. Because the man thinks he's getting some medicine. And so his mental abilities get rid of the pain. That's a placebo. It works that way. I can't do the same thing with belief though. I can't manufacture it. You see, if the doctor came to me and he said, you know, your problem is mental, I have some sugar pills here. Believe that these are medicine with all your heart. Believe they are medicine. Try very hard. And when you believe that they are medicine, the pain will go away. I can't do it. He told me they're sugar. I know better. So in the same way, it's not satisfactory that somebody comes and he says, believe, believe, believe. How can you believe if you know better? Faith overcomes, people told me. Faith overcomes.
You must be born again. And that I took a real interest in. You must be born again. 